There we go. So you guys should be able to see my screen in Microsoft Teams and the recording started. So I think my checklist of a million things that I have to remember to do is complete. So welcome to uh, week two for data visualization. Uh, this week we're going to get started on assignment one. So you're going to pick uh, a partner to interview. So, um, you know, for those of you who are online, I can create breakout rooms, uh, but it'll just be like a one on one thing. But it is an individual assignment. So you're going to interview them and then you're going to fill out, uh, you know, the questions and the answers that you get and then they're going to interview you. So it's going to then be a repeated process and then you're going to answer their questions and then they're going to fill out their sheet. So uh, that's going to be what we're working on towards the end of the class, but we're still going to go through a slide deck and some uh, some videos and then. Uh, yeah, but before we jump into that, I'd like to do a little icebreaker still since we're still getting to know each other. Hopefully uh, week one was uh, good for everyone. Oh, here we go. People are still joining. Sweet. Uh, hopefully week one was interesting and you know all those introductions are covered and now we're going to get into the uh, the meat of the course, I guess, or the uh, the actual topics that you're here for. So uh, we're going to get into the interesting stuff, but I still like to do some icebreakers as we're getting to know each other, especially for like interview things. Uh, it's nice to know a little bit about who you're interviewing as well. So uh, I'm going to share a link in Microsoft Teams if you're in Microsoft Teams uh, or you can just see the chat uh, and click this link. It's on. Oh, there you go. I believe that's it. It's on Microsoft Whiteboard. It's called Icebreaker Questions. And uh, you can see there's a ton here from these are just previous classes. But the one I want to ask you today uh, is what would be your next vacation spot? Where would you like to go? It could be somewhere in Canada. It could be somewhere abroad. It could be another country. But I'm going to I'm going to put it over here. And you guys can just. Surround it's in the bottom right, so you guys can just kind of surround this with uh, an image or just a word blurb of where you'd like to go and why, uh, what you'd like to check out. So, oh, there we go. What would be your next vacation spot? I think I would like to go to Hawaii. I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, it's warm, it's tropical, and they've got surfing. <laughs> so I love to surf. Uh, I love, you know, beaches. So I think Hawaii would be my next spot. But what about you guys? Where would you choose? I'm still thinking of going on a trip in British Columbia. Oh, yeah. Yeah, British Columbia is on my list too. I've never been there, but I've heard it's really beautiful. And it's I'm in the same country and I have never <laughs> I've never visited. Yeah, while you're in Canada, you have to go see that for sure. OK, let's see if this is a different link that might take you to. No, I don't think it does. Did that link work for you guys? OK, and you guys can find this all right. This little spot. I know it's uh, super zoomed in, but. I'll take mine. So someone put Banff last. Last time. I think this is mine, Hawaii. But you can just take a, an image from like Google Images or something. Hey, come on in. How's it going? Very good. How are you? Good, good. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Oh, no worries. The weather is uh, not very agreeable today. We're just doing a little icebreaker, so you don't have to do it on Teams, but I just asked people what would be your next vacation spot if you had to choose. So where would you go and why would you choose to go there? Oh, yeah, what do you think? Oh, oh. I'll put you on the spot. You can take a minute too if you want. Cuba. Cuba? Cuba. Oh, yeah. My favorite vacation destination. Really? Okay. And it's, why is that? I've been planning to go to a vacation for 15 years. Oh. Have you ever been before? <laughs> yeah, four times. Oh, okay. Wow. And where do yeah, you go when you're down there? Yeah. 
Veradero? Not a big fan of Veradero. No. <laughs> Do you go to? I've been I've been once to yeah Veradero. Is there uh, like a specific place you do like to go? Uh, well, uh, Holguin, I heard is very nice. Um, I heard also Santa Maria is very nice. Okay. But cool. I want to actually go and travel all of Cuba. Yeah. Just rent a car. And oh, that's awesome. I love Cuba. That's not too far either. It's only like a three hour flight, I think. Yeah. No, no, no even less than that. Around oh, yeah. two, two and a half. Oh, that's quick. Okay, awesome. Nice. And you've been a couple times. So do you go to resorts or you would like to check out yeah, like all of them? I always went to resorts. I really would love to check out that the people are the most wonderful people in the world. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Personally. We we went to Old Havana as well when we were there, and it's like the coolest place because they've yeah, got a market yeah. and yeah. On, did you visit uh, sorry to interrupt? Did you visit the uh, Hemingway? Uh, Hemingway. Oh, so long ago. Mansion. Oh, I don't remember. I don't think we would have. I didn't visit too. I just went with my, you know, yeah. ex <laughs> And then she's like, yeah, we, we must go to Yum, like Havana. Yeah. It's the most, um, the most Spanish city in uh, Latin America. It is cool. It's pretty cultured when you go there, for yeah, sure. Yeah, very cultured. Wonderful. Wonderful place. Awesome. Oh, cool. Thanks for sharing. No problem. Thanks. Um, okay, I see someone put Iceland Black Beach here. Who's that? Is that someone here? Or is that online? Iceland is cool. I like to go to Iceland. Black Beach. I've seen photos of that. That's a cool spot. Is, mine is yours showing? Oh, Switzerland? Yeah. yeah, why why Switzerland? I'll see if I can find it. Yeah, Switzerland is really yeah. pretty. Oh, is it here? Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe people are maybe people are putting them over at the old spot too. I uh I have two areas here where it's like what would be your next vacation spot. So we have like New York City, Banff, the Joshua Tree. Uh here's yours, Switzerland. Yeah. That is cool, yeah. I've been to Switzerland once. And uh, we did some hiking on the mountains, and it is just gorgeous. Like, you have like the these ibex goats that are just climbing the mountains beside you, and then you get to the top of the mountain. There's this guy with the uh, like the bugle, whatever it's called, and he's doing yodeling and stuff and playing it. And there's like the cows with the bells. It's just like everything you'd think of when you think Switzerland. It's awesome. Very cool. Bali is a good one. Ireland, Silicon Valley. For those of you who want to get a good programming job, there you go. Cool. Let's see if anyone. Yeah. Okay. Great. Just a fun little activity. Did you guys think of one before I move on? Oh no worries. You can you can just say it too if you want. Banff. Yeah, I've never been to Banff, but we do have a photo here somewhere. So Banff, Alberta. You could drive out there in like 40 hours or you could take a flight. I think it's like maybe four hours. That'd be a cool spot to go to. Lake Louise, I think, is this one. How's it going? We're just finishing up our icebreaker activity. I'm going to put you on the spot. We we're asking where would be your next vacation spot. Probably, but probably Europe. Europe, yeah? yeah. Any specific country? Maybe Switzerland. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we just had a Switzerland, so you can plan your trip together now. Switzerland, awesome. Do some mountain hiking. Cool. All right. Well, you guys can add images to that at any point, but uh, I'll just close that for now. And. We'll uh, we'll get into some of the week two material here. So this uh, week's lesson, can you guys read that? Okay, so it zoomed out a little bit. Am I sharing this screen? Here we go. Let me do this. That should be a bit clearer. No. There we go.
So this week's lesson is going to focus on something called the user centered or user centric design process uh, as a systematic method to deriving and documenting end user requirements. So we're going to start assignment one today and you're going to do it with a partner. Uh, there's going to be an interview process that happens and it's going to be two ways. It's not a group or partnered assignment. It's individual, but you need someone to interview and then you need someone to interview you as well. So we'll do breakout rooms or you can just pick corners in the classroom. Um, and if you're doing this asynchronous, you know, you'll have some time to do it throughout the week. Um, we're going to cover all of the instructions for how to do it and we're going to go through the first couple steps together in class as, as much time as we have. And then, uh, you know, there will be some that you have to do out of class as well. There's about seven steps for the interview process and we walk through it in the PowerPoint as we go. And then, uh, you know, I'll give you some time and then we'll continue through it. But basically, the main steps this week uh, is we're going to review the steps of the UCD. So that's the user centered design process. So we kind of watched some videos last week about like what that looks like when you're putting the user first and thinking about how they would use your dashboard or how they would use your visuals. And then we're going to find an end user to interview and then work through that exercise uh, with this person to complete assignment one. So you guys can download or open up the weekly content link here. This is uh, the PowerPoint with the instructions for assignment one. And then this assignment number one UCD participant handbook. If you can print it, I would recommend it probably be uh, like easier or if you prefer to do markings by hand, then you can print it, but you can also fill it out online. So the PowerPoints look like this today. So we'll start at the top and then the UCD handbook participant workbook looks like this. Oh, I think I'm just getting some feedback. There we go. So uh, if you do print it off, it's only nine pages and basically uh, you have these steps that you're going to go through and then you're going to write notes or type it if you've got the PDF version, uh, answering all these questions, going through each step and then page two, you're going to answer these questions and then go through, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll walk through it in more detail, but that's kind of the gist of what we're going to look at today. Um, and so here's just another short instruction based on what we've covered in this lesson. Both the user interface design and user experience are going to be very important aspects to visualizing our data um, in a way that connects with our audience. So when it comes to developing a dashboard, we're going to make some wireframes in this assignment. Uh, we're going to answer the question, what's more important, the user interface or the user experience? And then there's going to be a couple of videos we go through as well, so you can watch those here. All right, so. Any questions before we jump into it? Everyone got those. Uh, has it everyone been able to access the participant workbook? If yeah. you click that link, it works. OK, great. So just a little shout out before I get into it. This uh, participant workbook, you'll see this at the bottom, was made by someone named Valerie Mays. So she is, you can find her on LinkedIn here. She's a good friend of uh, the guy who used to teach this course before me. Uh, and then she's allowed me to use the material as well. So I just like to give her a little shout out. This is her on LinkedIn, but she's got uh, a ton of experience doing data visualization and user centered design. So right now she's at Sun Life Financial, uh, but she's been working in, uh, you know, healthcare, cancer research, cancer screening, and providing visuals to, you know, understand the statistics and um, answer those important questions for, you know, Health Quality Ontario and uh, other like sick kids. Uh, other really big organizations as well. So uh, she worked together with Eli on this and, and uh, created this participant workbook, which is really cool. <clears throat> Let's see. Does that come through? Cool. So a couple of the goals for today, what we're looking at is understanding the value of involving users when we're designing data visualization. So it's not just creating what you think they want to see or what you think is important, but it's actually involving them in that process and understanding how to involve them, like what types of questions to ask, what types of things to listen for when you're talking to them and what's going to be important to them. We're going to talk about UX versus UI and what's more important. Um, and then just introducing you to de designing the look and feel of charts and dashboards through wireframes. So I kind of gave you an introduction already to Valerie. She was an industrial engineer 
uh, a master's graduate. She has eight plus years doing healthcare for sick kids, Cancer Care Ontario, Health Quality Ontario. Um, and her data, her observations, obviously you can see uh, how they've impacted those organizations on the right. But uh, some of the work she's been involved in, uh, has anyone ever heard of Tableau's Iron Viz? So I have opened another tab here. You guys, I don't know the exact dates of it, but it's, where is it? Here, Iron Viz is a, a competition or yeah, May 18th. So it's actually coming up in two days. So it's the world's largest data viz competition. So you can register. So if you want to do this next year, once you've got all these skills honed in, then go for it. But uh, you can look at some of the stuff that these people create. Uh, basically, everyone gets the same data set. And then I think I was talking about, did I mention last week how there were some Georgian students who did the one at Mohawk College, the head competition, they got second place or something. There's a, there, they hold these competitions. What's that? Yeah, yeah, down in Hamilton. Yeah, so they all got, it's very similar to that, where they get a, they get a similar data set or the same data set as all these other groups. And then it's whoever can tell the most interesting story or answer the most relevant questions. So one of the winners from last year created this one, which is kind of cool. So it's called the Diary of a CEO. Oh, it's just loading here. There you go. Um, so you can see it's just a bunch of statistics on podcasts and it's all super interactive. So I'll put this link in Teams if you want to check it out. But as you uh, go through the report, like everything, all these little symbols have meanings or quotes from these podcasts, um, interesting themes that they track through each podcast, statistics on what was the most popular, you know, how many episodes, guests, industries, playback hours, um, the diversity in industries by week or by month. Um, and then even coming over here, this is kind of interesting. It was a subset exploring the themes from each episode. So they actually categorized each theme. So uh, what do we have here? Like money or uh, gratitude, purpose, and then link them together for each podcast, which is kind of cool. Uh, so that was the winner of 20, 2022 or 2021, I'm not sure. But I'll put that link in Teams. It's kind of interesting to check out. No. A diary of a CEO, which is cool. So anyway, she's also been involved doing some of the Iron Viz stuff. And then this is kind of just a preview of hopefully some of the stuff we're going to get involved in uh, today with doing some wireframe sketching and storyboarding. Very important part of the process uh, that also is involved in Val's process when she's doing work for these big companies. And then another really important part, and this is kind of what this is trying to mimic with this user centric design is involving feedback from the users. So getting your clients involved. So you can see here is like a camera roll of all these potential dashboards like here's a map with you know filled in area images of uh, I don't know what they're actually tracking here filtering by legal status but anyway she got all this feedback from the user so like one text clarification 32 percent requests came from Jamaica alone or I'd love to see individuals travel on the map as well so maybe have a dual access and uncheck that option so getting those uh, that feedback from users can be really valuable So I'll just get this video up here. I think this is on Blackboard, User Centered Design by Don Norman. It's a five minute video. Um, and let me know, can you guys hear it through the Teams meet? We interact with thousands of objects. Objects as simple as a toothbrush or a coffee cup, as complicated as a computer or an automobile. But not all of these items are designed to be easy to use. For example, how many of us have trouble programming our VCRs or accidentally lock the keys in the car? Don Norman has made a career of studying and improving the design of everyday things. As a boy, Don Norman wanted to know what makes things work. 
From his toys to the family radio, he tried to take them apart and figure them out. So it was not surprising that he got a master's degree in electrical engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. But he was also interested in how the human mind works. He went on to study cognitive science, earning a PhD in mathematical psychology from Penn, and going on to teach at the University of California at San Diego. Engineering and psychology may seem like two completely different fields, but when Norman was sent as part of a task force to study the Three Mile Island nuclear accident in 1979, all of his passions converged in one eureka moment that defined the rest of his career. To make errors, to cause errors, you couldn't have done a better job. That was a magic moment. What that did was bring back all of my engineering background to psychology and say, hey, we now know a lot about psychology and we know a lot about engineering. You've got to take the two and put them together. Norman began to work on the design of high-tech objects like computers and aviation technology. But while on a sabbatical in Cambridge, England, he found that design problems were everywhere in the world around him. I discovered I couldn't work for the water faucets, water taps, or the light switches, or the stove. I couldn't even open doors. I couldn't figure out whether I should push or pull. I asked myself one major question. I said, I walk around the world, encounter new objects all over time. How do I know how to use them? Norman's observations led him to write a book that has become a classic, The Design of Everyday Things. So I tried to understand this communication process between the object and the person. What were the signals that let me understand it? Norman asked, that they encounter every day. He found that many objects that were different designers set of simple but powerful principles that forced them to think about how their products would be used, who would be using them, and why. What I tell designers and engineers is that they need to understand the context in which the tool device they are using is to be employed. A problem with many designers and engineers is that they're too logical. And logic is wonderful, but it doesn't describe real behavior. So when we're designing technology, we have to design for real people. Norman observed that emotions play a crucial role in good design. Even if we understand an object on a cognitive or intellectual level, we might still hate using it, which makes that design a failure. So emotional design is a critical part of design. Things that we come to love, things that we come to hate, Cognition yeah. is trying to understand the nature of the world. Emotion is an information processing system in the head that is evaluating the world, determining what's good or bad, safe or dangerous. And it takes precedence over cognition most of the time. He believes that even if you need to be taught how to use it the first time, if the object is designed well, you will never need to relearn how to use it. And one of the things I teach about design is, you know, it's okay if you can't use it the first time. It's okay if you have to read a book or someone has to instruct you. But it's not okay if you have to do the same thing a second time. Good design is, when someone shows it to you, you say, oh, I see. Bad design is where you still don't understand it. Norman's design concepts have been applied to just about every kind of technology imaginable. And he constantly sees opportunities to improve the way we live and interact with technology everywhere he looks in the world around him. I spent a lot of time just walking around, watching, trying to observe people in natural settings, trying to see how they behave, what problems they encounter today, where things go well. Many scientists have laboratories. They go off and do experiments. To me, my laboratory is the real world. But 2006, Benjamin Franklin met computer and cognitive science is awarded to Donald A. Norman. Okay. So, can you think of any um, examples of what he's talking about? Like, everyday things that are just poorly designed, where you, can, you see yourself just making a mistake on a regular basis. Yeah, push and pull doors. Push and pull doors? Yeah, I, I don't do Yeah, all the time, because you don't know, uh, like, if it has a handle uh, versus if it just has like that's a square that square thing, right? Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, and you don't know. 
Yeah, or sometimes they'll say like, uh, they don't even say pull or push on them. Like sometimes they have the signs which helps. But yeah, that's a great example. Anything else? Um, the stuff, like we have full burner and full loss for it. Yeah. I always get confused which one does. Yeah, and you don't know which one does what. Yeah, yeah stoves are all, always confusing, totally. Or like hot water and cold water, if it's not labeled with the blue and the red. Yeah. Any others? Let's see if I can find. Uh, here's one. Uh, I don't know if my screen is being shared on the other one, but so I've got a can of. Um, we've got a can of canola cooking spray here, and then the same company, Black and Gold, branded their fly and insect killer. And I mean, like, that's totally poor design because if someone uses that, <laughs> yeah, if they put flying insect killer on their pan to cook bacon, then I don't think they're going to have a good breakfast. Or there's this one here. We have very, very similar looking uh, deposit bins. One accepts trash, one accepts donations. You could very easily get those mixed up. Um, can you guys see the screen on the teams? I think I switched which. Oh, no, I didn't. There we go. Can you see this? So this was the second one that I showed, and this was the first one. And then this video. So this is what you were talking about. Bad doors are everywhere. Yeah, not knowing what type of door. So this one's kind of funny. <laughs> The same guy from the other video. Hello, Professor. Hello, we can't hear anything. It's not audible, please. You guys can't hear anything? Yeah, it's not audible to me also. I was thinking that uh, it's like that, but it's not audible. OK, one sec. Let's see here. Include computer sound. There you go. Hopefully you get the gist of it from the second half. <laughs> Let me know if you hear this. More than doors. And it's amazing with many of our computer systems today, you look at it, there's no way of knowing what's possible. Should I uh, tap it once? Thank you. And triple tap? So discoverability, when it's not there, well, you don't know how to use something. Another is feedback. And so many times there's no feedback. You have no idea what happened or why it happened. And these principles form the basis of how designers and engineers work today. 
commonly known as user or human-centered design. I decided at one point the word user was a bit degrading. Why not call people people? And it's amazingly simple and amazingly seldom practiced. We call it iterative because it sort of goes around in a circle. We go out and we observe what is happening today. We observe people doing the task. And from that, we say, oh, we have some ideas. Here's what we should perhaps propose to do. Then you prototype your solution and test it. Quite often, these are wrong at first. But each time we go around the circle, we do a better job of making the device until the point we're actually making something that really works. And this process has spread all over the world. And it turns out it's improving lives. From better everyday things like the ones that Don wrote about. To using the same process to solve huge problems in public health in developing countries. Water. Sanitation. Farming. Lots more. So what would be a better human-centered door? An ideal door is one that as I walk up to it and walk through it, I'm not even aware that I had opened the door and shut it. So if you had a door which had a flat plate, what could you do? Nothing. The only thing you can do is push. So see, you wouldn't need a sign. A flat plate, you push. This kind of push bar with the piece sticking out on one side works well too. So you can see what side you're supposed to push on. The vertical bars could go either way. A simple little hand thing though sort of indicates pull. But we still have terrible, terrible doors in the world. So many of them. There are lots of things in life that are fairly standardized and therefore whether I buy this house or not is not a function of whether it has good doors in it. And so uh, except for safety reasons, doors tend not to be improved. But the tyranny of bad doors must end. I think that it's a really shit design. In fact, they put a pull handle when it's a push. And it should be a flat panel right here and not a you're right becky you're goddamn right and if we all thought like you well we might just design a better world together it won't open because it's a security door <laughs> what the f- are you two doing hey so as you can see since i started <laughs> there you go so kind of a funny one on the same note I'll switch back to this. So you has and you now that you've seen it, have you guys experienced bad doors? I know you were saying that, yeah. I think most people have. I don't know, is there any in the college? I was trying to think of if you can think of one, if you come across a spot in the next uh couple of weeks at Georgian that has bad doors, let me know because then I can I can point them out to the rest of the class to go experience or experiment with their bad doors. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add something in regards to the, the psychology of um, action, like opening, closing doors. Yeah. I, he didn't mention that, uh, that, that professional about, um, I, I, he kind of, came to me yesterday when I was driving through uh, Niagara County and back, uh, Murphy's Law. Uh, it's the way it works. It's like usually something that you do um, against uh, like, for for example, like traffic, changing lanes, thinking yeah. in traffic, you'll be going faster. But Murphy's Law dictates probably going to be going the same speed. Yeah. Eventually. That's like when you're at the border crossing and then you decide, oh, I'm going to go to this lane because it looks like it's going like a lot faster. Yes, and then yes. all of a sudden all the cars that you were in. Yeah, just go. moving. Yeah, I think it could kind of you could kind of relate the two closely. Yeah. Um, but hopefully with at least with user centered design or human centered design, we can avoid some of that stuff so that people don't have to relearn every single time they're using our dashboards or our, our visualizations. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Great thought. Um, so UCD, or as he mentioned in the video, human-centered design, uh, you can refer there pretty much the same things. Um, we do uh, interactive design process based on user feedback. So it's an interactive thing. You're constantly involving the user or the human, um, considering every single stage of design. So from the very prototype at the beginning to the very end where you're choosing like the fonts and the colors and the spacing and getting all those pretty details. Uh, figured out. 
understanding the users and their tasks and their environments. So if they're using it on their desktop or on their phone, or if it's going to be a printed report that's emailed to executives, um, and then being able to create that product that's adapted to that context. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about UX versus UI. So UX, do you guys know what I mean when I say UX versus UI? User experience versus user interface? Yeah, what do I mean? So user experience is uh, we have, all, like we have our VI and you, uh, user is going through, if everything is being like arranged appropriately and you know where to go and user is able to comprehend it really good, so that's a good user experience. Yeah. But uh, UX, on the other hand, is uh, us making uh, the Power BI, uh, like fitting it at every block and stuff. So it's kind of uh, Yeah, yeah, where UI is more focused on like the, the design details, like do the colors match? Are the contrasts, is the contrast too high? Uh, you know, uh, is the font legible? Does it, like if you use multiple font families, do they complement each other? Is the spacing, you know, uh, is there enough spacing, you know, balance of white space to actual content? Whereas, yeah, user experience is the flow, right, of the app. So when you go in and you swipe back, you know, you're expected to go back a screen. When you click this button, you know, and you're going through a control flow or an activity flow, you understand the process of where you're going to end up, and it's very intuitive, and you can understand it right away. So, yeah. Very good. Um, oh, so here, uh, talking about user experience, how can we make the experience of interacting with a computer or a smart smartphone, a product, a service as intuitive, smooth, and pleasant, those are other words, as possible? So making it, you can just kind of see this wheel on the bottom right, accessible, uh, useful, usable, findable, valuable, uh, desirable, you know, less is more. Sometimes where if you're just overloading them with a ton of different options, they're not going to know what to do. Um, whereas UI is more focused on, you know, the colors, um, you know, if the slider is, you know, turned on, how are you designing it to indicate that it's turned on? If a button's been clicked or not clicked, if it's disabled, is it grayed out? Um, and you can see some of the examples there in that image. Progress bars are another thing where you're indicating like how far along something. So here we're about like a quarter of the way, two thirds of the way, or going across this, right? You, you've highlighted it or you've shaded the progress. So this is kind of, uh, you remember that wheel that he talked about, like the user centric design? So this is our version of it that we're going to do in this course. And we're going to cover the first three in assignment one. So it starts with research, which is going to be that interview that you have with your partner. And then you're going to start to wireframe, which is just, you know, sketching up mockups. And I actually prefer if you have a pencil or a pen, do it on paper because then it's just really easy to draw it out and physically see it. Um, but you can use Figma or, or Adobe XD as something if you want to. And then prototyping where you can actually build, you know, I prefer that your wireframe is on pen and paper and then your prototype, you can use some software like Figma where you can actually um, go through and make the screen jump to another screen so it actually gets triggered. Um, it's not actually a functional app, but it's like when I click this button, then this screen appears. And then you can understand the prototype, show it to your user. Um, and each step along the way, we're involving the user, right? So that's the importance of user-centered design. It's not just step one, we research and interview them, and then we just go all the way to the end without them, it's every step along the way, we're involving that user and we're saying, hey, OK, now that I've got the wireframe, what do you think about the wireframe? They give you some suggestions, some feedback, you make changes. Hey, now that we've got the prototype, what do you think of the prototype? What do you want me to change? Et cetera, et cetera. So again, visual cues, we covered this last week. Some of the things you can think about are size, color, shape, brightness, alignment, saturation, uh, orientation, and then texture. So assignment number one, we'll, we'll have a quick break soon, but assignment number one, you're going to design a web-based dashboard for your partner that monitors their progress towards their version of a healthy lifestyle. Okay, so 
some examples of things that they might want to have tracked. And it's going to be different for everyone because it's all going to be centered around whoever your user is, right? So for me, maybe I want to track how many steps I've walked. Or for someone else, maybe they want to track how many minutes they've meditated that day. Sugar versus salt intake, right? So each person has a different idea of what health looks like to them. It could be like stairs climbed, um, you know, time outside, time in the sun, uh, screen time at my computer. And you're going to make a dashboard starting with a wireframe or starting with interview questions actually about what that health, uh, healthy lifestyle looks like for them. Any questions about that? We'll kind of get into it as we go, but that's going to be the basis for assignment one here. So phase one, so this is going back to this, right? We've got six phases here. Phase one is research. What are we researching? We're researching our users, right? So we want to know what they think or what their idea of a healthy, active lifestyle is. So the attributes of that, the activities, the environment that they're going to be using this dashboard in. Why do we want to research our users? Because everybody's different. So the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act, my interpretation of what healthy is to me might be different than anybody else in this room, right? Um, and our contexts are all unique. Maybe I really prefer to do sports where someone else prefers to do individual activities like biking or walking. And I want to track how many minutes I play baseball and they want to track how many minutes they spent, uh, you know, cycling downtown. And it's, that's totally okay. So our contexts are unique, our jobs, our environments, um, our values, our beliefs, uh, the activities and tasks we perform. So you can't just assume that we want to track, you know, how many hours like you sleep, right? That might not be something that your uh, user, whoever you're interviewing wants to track. So you're just going to ask those questions. So who are your users and what do they need? So attributes, activities and environments were the three things that we broke down and each of those kind of have further breakdowns. So we have, uh, you know, accessibility. Is there any accessibility that you need to think about with how they're interacting with this? Um, data literacy, so being able to interpret the data, um, the tasks, the problems, the current state, their location, the technology they're accessing it on, their culture, um, time and relationships. How can we understand our users? So you can see down here, these are all different ways. I don't know if it's super legible, but these are all different ways we can understand our users or perform user research. And you can see that key on the bottom. So the green circle is natural use of the product. The red is scripted, so like lab based. Uh, the yellow triangle is uh, if they're not using the product, so it's out of context. And then the blue diamond is uh, a hybrid or a combination of them. So you can see in the bottom left, what we're going to be doing is interviews. So that's, you know, qualitative, it's direct. Whereas, you know, you can do things like uh, email surveys, which is on the far right hand side of it. So that's more quantitative. We could do focus groups. We could do customer feedback. You could do usability lab studies. Um, so we're going to be focusing our efforts on interviews today. So these are a couple examples of questions that we're going to be looking at. So you've got your who, your what, your why, your when, your where, your how, right? So the examples of questions I give you in the assignment, you don't have to ask only those. You can think of more. Um, the more questions you ask, basically the more information you're going to have and the better you can serve your, your customer, or your user, right? So that's how we can learn who they are, what activities and what environment they want in those one on one conversations. And then once you ask those questions, so if you only ask the ones, the questions that I give you, uh, I like to suggest that you use these things called probes where it's now. So you've asked, OK, tell me about. Uh, why are you doing this, right? I want to be healthier. OK, well, it's like, OK, well, why is that important, right? or you just start to probe that conversation so that they open up a little bit more. So it's asking those open ended questions. It's not it's not leading them to a yes or a no. It's like, OK, so why do you want to do this? They give you maybe like two sentence two sentence answer and then you say, OK, like I hear that this is why you want to do that, right? So you're doing the echo and then 
tell me more about the last time you've tried to do something like this? Or can you give me an example of uh, some of the things that you like to do that you per that you perceive as healthy? Or, oh, oh, how so? Or tell me more about that, right? So using these probes, you can now expand and then you can get more information about what your user actually feels and what they want out of this. So key things to consider. So I said, don't ask leading questions. Um, that's the first one. So don't ask leading questions that suggest the answer, right? So don't say like, I'm trying to think of an example. Don't say, okay, so sleep must be, you know, sleep is a pretty healthy thing. So would you want to track your sleep, right? And then it's like, oh yeah, sure, right? Like let them answer. Keep it open ended and don't don't just like kind of um, feed the answers to them. Don't ask what they want. Just uh, yeah, don't ask what they want. Ask what what they would. What does that say? What they would buy. Don't ask if they would buy. Oh, sorry. They don't see the future. And don't ask how much they would pay for it, right? So we're just trying to create this dashboard. You're not trying to talk about mark like money or uh, marketing or any of those things. Um, ask about past experiences or specific moments. Ask them to show how they're actually doing it. Um, Open-ended questions, so can you tell me more about that? Um, if you want them to compare a couple things. Um, and then trying to understand their motivations. So like why, what's their reasoning behind that? Or why they want to track this specific statistic in, in their life, right? So you might realize if they want to track sleep, and you keep asking why, you might figure out, okay, they're not having very good sleeps. This is probably one of the most important things to them. Let's track that. Okay, so we'll take a 10 minute break here, but if you wanna jump right into it or take 10 minutes to find a partner um, in Microsoft Teams, and then I can create the breakout rooms, um, you can download that participant handbook, <clears throat> and then you can digitally annotate or record your answers using pen and paper. And you're gonna start with page two, with the focus of the analysis being about achieving healthier lifestyle, interview your partner and record their answers on page two of the handbook. So, page two of the handbook, we'll come down here. You're gonna ask these questions to your partner. You're gonna write them down here. Okay, and don't forget to do the open-ended, use those probes, try to get as much information as you can and fill this entire section with notes. And then you're gonna do a role swap and then they're going to interview you, right? And you might have totally different things that you want to you know, achieve in terms of health. So we'll come back at 11. I'll give you guys some time to, if you want to just go grab a coffee or whatever, uh, and then pick a partner, and then I can create the breakout rooms um, in uh, Microsoft Teams. Do you need a laptop for this? Do you need a laptop for this? Uh, if you wanted to like type the answers out, you could, but if you want to just write them down. Yeah, because I didn't bring my laptop for this. Yeah, so if you if you want to just write them down, then you can do that. Um, I was saying earlier, like if you have the means to print this, it's nine pages. And then if you find it easier to just, you know, circle or draw or whatever, then uh, then do that. <clears throat> uh, oh, yeah, 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 sure. Sounds good. Yeah, how does it work? I was just looking it up. You can go to printing. Georgian. College. or something. Uh, uh, in the library, there is a system where you have to log in, and then you have to put your, uh, you have to initiate your uh, printing from there. <clears throat> yeah, it's a paper cut, right? It's like this. No, no, no. You just have to go there. Sign in. This must be something. Okay. Because I saw that this is a way to print as well, but I don't know if it's like you can choose your. Yeah, I don't know how to choose where you print though with this thing. I'm not sure. Over there, it's just like you hit the command and then. Yeah, that might be easier. <clears throat> Just 
turn this off. Question. Yeah. Do you mind if I um, add something about sure. user experience, um, which is UX? Yeah. Um, like I have both uh, Mac OS, uh, a laptop, Mac Pro, and a pretty much high end, more not a high end, but a, a Windows based laptop. Yeah. And when it comes to user experience, yeah, Apple compared to a Mac compared to a Windows device, it's Mac over. <laughs> oh really? Eh? Oh, like it, like user friendliness. I think that's why Mr. Steve Jobs was so loved. Let me and ask Mac you this: still to this day. Which um, which platform did you use first? Uh, I used Windows first, oh, okay, and then I I, I moved to uh, Mac OS with my Mac Pro like seven years ago. Yeah, switching back to Windows, like I can I can do it no problem, but the user friendliness of a Mac is just interesting. Sorry, that's why the 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 cost like twice. Or you know, I find actually the opposite. I oh, yeah. can't stand Mac OS. I find it so confusing. I grew up using Windows and like I've always used Windows, but I find Mac like because I learned programming on Windows. Oh, yeah. um, anytime I experience like an issue or a bug or like I can't find a file, I have no idea where it went or something on a Mac. I just lose my mind. I yeah, get so that, frustrated. That <laughs> yeah. So I feel like the opposite is, as you. So I don't know. Maybe it's just like people have their own preference for what they. But it's just <clears throat> the operation of the device. Yeah. And the fact that you they don't push um, all the advertising, all that you need to uh, do this upgrade. You just get an upgrade every three months, four months push to you. I think yeah, something that Steve Jobs did that was like revolution, revolutionary, excuse me, was like the design of the devices physically was like super beautiful. Whereas Windows were always like these clunky, chunky machines. Mac was like this, you know, perfect capsule and you never had to touch it or open it. And it was just like this beautiful unibody aluminum, right? Or like even their iPhone was like the first full screen uh, glass iPhone. So I think like in terms of his design of the physical devices, they're like, they beat Windows hands down. Um, and I think too, like relatively speaking for like general population, Mac is a lot more intuitive, like a lot easier to get into. But if you wanted to do like customizability and like programming and things like that, I think Windows, yeah, definitely. that's where they take the, uh, the advantage, which is why I prefer it. Cause that's what the stuff that I do, right? Whereas on Mac, if I wanted to like get admin privileges to something and I'm trying to type in terminal, I'm like, what the heck do I do here? To... <laughs> so I, I don't yes, like Mac. Yes, uh, when it comes to programming Mac, definitely not, a, not an option. Mm. But when it comes to user friendliness, like design, yeah, uh, that's what we're talking about. Here, yeah, like product design or totally graphical design. Like I, I have uh, Adobe Photoshop on my Mac. Yeah, and and other things like just the way how quick it is. Like it's an eight gig, seven year old machine. But it works faster than a brand new, uh, yeah, Windows-based uh, gaming laptop with best graphics, best well, uh, i7, like new i7, and like good processor, good RAM, everything. The Mac OS still works. I'm oh, sorry, the MacBook still still works faster. Yeah, it just amazes me. Like seven-year-old Mac works faster than a brand new top-of-the-line Windows laptop. Yeah, that, that is kind of a nice thing too. Like I find like Windows laptops, they definitely feel like they slow down after a while. Plus all the pushing of stuff that you like advertising and everything else that slows down the whole system. That's how Windows started to work with Windows uh, 12. Windows, Windows 10, sorry, Windows 10. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, did I hear someone? Hello? Uh, yeah, Professor, I'm yeah, joining the session. Joining session. Uh, 
so to uh, find so a plot, to find a plot, uh, like given a time, uh, time, uh, time uh, we will need to tag uh, somebody and just find. Say that again. So to find a partner, just find someone online. Is that what you need to do for this assignment? Uh, yeah, like, uh, for yeah, example, like, uh, for example, uh, 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 do we need to find a partner? Do we need to find a partner? Uh, like, uh, I think, like, not everyone is there online. So, is there any way? Yeah, so if you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you wanted to do this um, with us as we go through it, like, in class live, then just message the chat, message the uh, the class, or I don't know if there's a way to personally message. I think you could probably like right click someone's name and then you can send a quick message to them on Teams. And then uh, once you've figured out who your partner is going to be that you're interviewing and, and then they're going to interview you, then I'll create a breakout room uh, when we do our discussions and then I'll bring you guys back to the main session um, once we go back to the slides. So you're able to do the interview process write down your notes and I don't know how long that will take. We'll kind of base it as we go. But yeah, once you get your partner, then just let me know and I can create the breakout room um, for the online groups. Sure, Professor, how about sure, the, uh, the document? Do we need to take a breakdown of that? And the okay, by just uh, referring to the screen. Yeah, so it's up to you. Uh, if you have the means to print it out, then um, I that's how I would work. That's how I would prefer to do it is just have a printed out document. Um, but if you wanted to do it digitally and, and annotate or or type over it with, uh, you know, your PDF viewer, Adobe Acrobat or something, then um, then that's fine too. The the reason I, I say this, I suggest to print it out is because with the wireframes, there's a section to do wireframe drawings and you're going to find a lot easier to just draw them out with the user um, with pen and pencil uh, to record those those things. So, okay, Profits, thank you. Yeah. And for those of you who are watching the recording, um, yeah, you just have to find a partner um, from the class list or email me, and then I can I can partner you up with someone who hasn't got a partner yet. Paper cut is the, uh, what do you call that? Plugin that they are using downstairs. Yeah. So that's the thing that's been used to uh, get our breakdowns. Paper cut is? Basically, we can use it. But I, we don't know how to do it. So it's just like if you load it through your paper cut, yeah. it's going to load it into your one card. And then wherever there is a printer, you just go that. OK. Let's see. So you can load a job. So I'm assuming it'd be Barry admin, Barry find me, Barry Lakehead. I'm assuming it'd be this one. Upload documents. Or as it's the plugin, like the printer location was something. Students. Yeah. So that's the document. Upload and complete. I have no idea where this is going to print, though. So usually there is like uh, the printer over there as a one card space. So what we do is we just press on that. Yeah. And if it's associated with our account, it's going to show the print. Hmm. Then you're going to just print it. Just 
size Allen Q. Interesting. Benjamin? Yeah. Good question. Uh, we have like another amount of students. How do I have to just try to log in at the moment? Uh, yeah, so it's a good question. I just had some people asking me about how they could find someone. So yeah, you could find someone in Microsoft Teams here that's online with you that uh, can do it with you. Or if there's someone that you could find that's planning on coming into class, if you're planning on coming into class, yeah, yeah. Uh, then that might be good. Yeah. <clears throat> so you can type in the chat if there's anyone. Let's see what. Uh, hello, Professor. Hello. Uh, I'm not able to find the handbook. Uh, where exactly is it? You're not able to find it in Blackboard? Yeah. 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 OK, let's see yeah. what we do here. One second. I'll share my screen and. Uh, share my screen with you here. So you're in the week two folder. Share screen. OK, so we'll jump back into it here, but basically we're going to start uh, start our interviews. So to find the handbook, it's right here. So you come to the well, I'll just jump to the main course so you can see weekly learning on the left hand side. And then once you click weekly learning, we go into module one, which is focusing on the design of DataViz, and then the week two folder here. And then the UCD participant handbook is this link down here. It's the fifth, fifth link down. So basically now what you're going to do, we're on slide, uh, we're on slide 25. So our instructions now are to open up that handbook and we're going to go through page two. So I'm going to give you guys a bunch of time yeah, to just go through the interviews. If you have a partner, and then we'll, we'll yeah, figure out partners you, for those of you who don't have it. You got it? OK, sweet. So go through these questions. I'll give you a bunch of time. And once it sounds like conversations are petering out, then I'll move back into the slides. So if you want me to create a breakout room for you guys in Teams, or if you want to start a separate call and then come back to the main meeting, um, then go for it. And I can try to help you out with that too. We also have, what's your name again? Artem. Artem. We have Artem in class here as well. So he's looking for someone to join him uh, to do an interview with for his dashboard. So if there's someone on Teams that wants to join Artem, um, and he's coming to class every week. So if one of you are planning on coming to class, then that would also probably be the best for doing collaboration with him. Uh, 
like are we supposed to record on this subject time? Oh, yeah, hello. Uh, are we very quiet? To, uh, record the submit as a proof. Oh, sorry, I can't. I can't hear you. You're just really quiet. Do you want to type it in the chat? Like, are we supposed to record the interview question? We're going to go through the interview questions now, yeah. Professor, I think uh, she is asking the we suppose you record this interview with the partner. Sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing <laughs> what you guys are saying. Do you want to just type the question in the chat and then I can hear what you're going to try to answer you? Oh, I see. So you don't have to record, you don't have to record the interview, but you just have to, I guess, make record of the notes. So when they're answering questions. You got to write down what you're going to find relevant to make that dashboard for them. Right, so we're going to we're going to make basically a SketchUp or a wireframe of that dashboard. So you're going to write down anything that you think is helpful. You know, first question, tell me a little bit about you. They're going to tell you a little bit about them and you're going to write down those notes or type them out. You don't have to record it like the video. Uh, unless you want to and they have and they're OK with that and then you can come back to it and, and make more notes, but. Uh, I'll create the breakout rooms, but just let me know who your partner is and then I can throw you into a breakout room together. So we're just we're doing these discussions right now in class, so if you guys are online, you want to do these discussions. Let me know who you're going to do it with. You can interview with anyone. It's just an individual assignment, so it's not like um, it's not like it's a group submission or anything. OK, so Tin, Tin and Melind. Sure. I'll create a room for you guys. Hello, Professor. Hello, Professor. Hello. Yeah, I would like to be in the same room. Say that again, sorry. I said I would like to be in the same room with Oluole. Oluole. Oh, Ulu Ole. Yes. You and Christopher? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Hello. Google and Google and Christopher for room two. OK, you guys should get that. And then uh, someone else said. For Ravikant and 
Go Repria. Yeah. Ravikant and go we put it. Room three, go we put it. Room three, sign. Venusia and say, Venusia and say. Sure. Venusia and say. Room four. Venusia, room four. All right, so we've got four breakout rooms. If it is an odd number, Artem, then what you could do is you could just get interviewed by one of these guys after, or interview one of them after, or uh, if you can find someone, you could do a group of three online as well. So it's whatever you prefer, but. I definitely prefer, prefer in person. Sure, yeah, sounds good. Yeah. When would you use this information? So, like, would they check the dashboard in the morning, like every morning when they wake up? Would they use it on a weekly basis? Would they check it, uh, you know, like every hour on their phone? Like, would they want like constant updates? Like, oh, you made this many steps this hour, kind of like that. What question are you guys on for the interviews right now? Four. Four? Yeah. You've done all of them? Yeah, we're diving deeper now. Nice. These are the notes that come up with. Oh, nice. There you go. Sweet. Okay, so you guys are still just doing the first first phase? Yeah, we're just doing the oh, okay. I was going to say, so Artem would uh, want to do in-person as well. So if there's a group that you guys would want to do, yeah. like... Why don't we, like, collide? We can do... Yeah, you can do, like, a triangle almost. Triangle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sweet. Thanks, guys. Yeah, sweet. And then we'll get a dashboard for each other. You can make my dashboard for each other. Yeah, sweet. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, guys.
Okay, so. Alarm 
monitoring, so doing more of a service kind of job the remainder of everyone, mostly everyone that Chromebooks, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
One more minute, and then I'm sorry to interrupt. We're going to do one more minute, and then we're going to come back to the main session. You guys can keep doing the interviews after, because then we're just going to go to phase two and continue the process. So. Hi, Professor. Hi, Professor. Hello, Israel. How's it going? I'm doing good, sir. I just joined. Awesome. Welcome. Um, do you, is there any free part that I can join with, please? Uh, that's a great question. Is there anybody that's still looking for a partner? Israel is looking. Are we back to the main class? Yep, we're coming back to the main room. So we're just going to pause on the okay. interviews here for a second, guys, and then we'll come back to them and, and continue. Um, so if you are still looking for partners, remember there's that discussion board that I showed you. Um, really quickly, I'm just going to jump over to it here. Uh, so this is the assignment submission link. It's due June 5th. 11.59, 15% of your grade, it's individual. And uh, what you're submitting is going to be this PDF file that is representing your healthier lifestyle dashboard prototype. And then the completed participant handbook. So you can find that blank version, that's what you're filling out today. And then you're going to fill that out either by paper and then scan it or uh, hand it in to me in person. Um, and then I'll just mark it down that you've had it in, or you can just type it out and upload it as well. Okay, so that's the submission link. Again, if you're looking for a partner, there's this discussion forum over here. And then module one, that's what we're in here. So come to this module one data viz design. And if you want to, uh, you know, just shout out that you're looking for somebody, that's a good spot to do it, or send me an email, and then I will collect you know, names of people who are still looking for partners and pair you up together. All right. <clears throat> so coming back to the main PowerPoint, the main slide we're on, how can we make sense now? I know some of you are still uh, doing the interviews. Show of thumbs from Microsoft Teams, how many of you guys finished through all the questions? Both people. So you, you, you finished? Yeah, I got thumbs up in person here. And you finished swapping roles, and then you did it back and forth between both people. Uh, hello, hello, please, hello. Hey, Chris. Yeah, please, I have a question. Are we supposed to, like, now, the the question I'm answering, is it the question for my partner or my own question? So you're interviewing your partner, and you're going to create a dashboard for them, and they're going to be the user of this dashboard. So this is the whole idea is this user-centered design that we're looking at, right? So it's going to be, 
you're creating a healthy lifestyle dashboard for their for your partner you're trying to get whatever their requirements and their idea of a healthy lifestyle okay. is and then you're actually going to end up creating this dashboard prototype and wireframe and then you're going to actually create the dashboard right and then they're going to now ask you the questions and create one for you so you're kind of creating it for each other if that makes sense yeah okay i have a problem with question two that says um what aspect of healthy lifestyle would you like to monitor in 2019 is it this year or 2019 <laughs> oh that just hasn't been updated for a while so 2022 you know whatever you want to track if it's if it's like your step count if it's your sleep hours if it's what you're eating you know if you're tracking like trans fats or saturated fats calories it could be you know hours spent outside hours in the sun you know how many hours of active healthy lifestyle you're, you're doing each day you can really track whatever you want to you could track screen time or you know time sitting or movies that you've watched um not movies that you watch, but like how many hours you sit in front of a screen or something. But yeah. Okay. But you guys, you guys had enough time to get through the questions. No, we just I'm I'm just trying to like um, take them down one after the other, but I'm not done yet. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. You can do them after class too if you run out of time. Yeah, you have a question. So the partner is gonna be reported later. Yeah, so you'll start collecting. Yeah. So and and we'll get to that. That's way down the road, but. So now we're looking at this next phase of analysis. So we've hopefully we're getting to a point where we've collected information. You've got, you know, I saw some notes that people have written down pages of notes on their user, right? On their partner. So how can we make sense of what we've collected? Now we've got to start analyzing it. Well, now we can go through something called the user needs template. So what do they need? Not what do they want? That's what that was uh, referring to earlier. So there's some questions here that we can ask. Who is the user? Where should the product fit into their work or their life? So what that means is, is it going to be something that they're using every day? Is it going to be something that they use at the gym? Is it going to be something that they do in the morning? How is it going to be part of their lifestyle? Like if you think about, uh, for example, something like uh, a journal that you have, if you were to write like a journal or a diary, and that's like a daily thing that you do at the very end of the day. Is it going to be something like that, or is it going to be like a weekly reminder that's an email? How is this going to be part of their life? Um, number three, what problems should our product solve? So are we going to try to encourage them to be healthier? Are we going to try to um, just give them insights and data into how they're currently living? Number four, when and how should our product be used? So how often? Um, and how it's going to be used. Is it, so it's going to be a web app, but is it also going to be accessible via mobile? Um, and how do we want our user to interact with it? Number five, what features are important to our users? So that's going to be a question we ask our user, right? What features do they want in this? And number six, how should it look and how should it behave? So open up page three of your handbook with the focus of the analysis being about a healthier lifestyle. I want you to analyze your findings and record the information in the user interview synthesis on page three. If you're still on page two and you're still collecting that information, that's fine. Um, but then once you finish that, move on to page three and start answering some of those questions. And then once you've finished answering the questions for your partner, swap roles and then they're going to ask you the questions and they'll answer them about you. All right. So I'll open the breakout rooms again. If you have any questions, we can clear them up now. And then uh, I'll, I'll send you guys back into the breakout rooms. Sound good? And if you're still on page two, continue just doing those interviews. Sweet. Right. You guys good for me to open the breakout rooms on Microsoft Teams? Yes. Good. Here we go. So Kieran, do you have a partner? Oh, you're oh, <laughs> you're in the Teams group. Oh, I see. I was like, I see Kieran on here. All right. 
So, and Artem's in class two, so then we've got Israel. So Israel, you're still looking for someone. So we'll see if someone can join. If not, um, you might have to find someone who's doing this work asynchronously and then ask those questions with them and then plan to come in class or, or join online next week at the same time. Yeah, 
Oh, you just swapped it. Yeah, it's it. Yeah. Okay, you swapped it already? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So you can feel free to take a 10 minute break once you're done, and we'll come back at like 10 after 12. Yeah. 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 So my school is bigger than my Well, 
listening to it on yeah. radio and different than actually listening to it. Yeah. You know. Okay. Um, so yeah, then after that, uh, after my bachelor's, I I did my artificial intelligence course from Jordan, right now in 2006. During my bachelor's, I got into a lot of stuff. I got into speak with a in my college. We won some championships. And uh, I was composing the music for them recently. And, uh, I got into fitness at that time. So I used to go to the gym and stuff. That's when I started learning about health, about all the macro micronutrients, how they affect you. I did that. I was, I was, I was mostly study, most of my life. But then I got fit, and then now I'm back to being chubby, and now I'm trying to get in shape. Or yeah. it's always possible you get in shape. It's all, yeah, it's all, it's all my. Life. Okay. Sometimes you go in the body looks pretty good. Sometimes you go in the like that. At that time, you could look at the body. So you said your favorite sports uh, are cricket and basketball. basketball. Uh, not, not, not. I came in in August last week. Oh, okay. That's pretty much it. You look like a person who's like, well, you kind of want to do it. <laughs> Fighting, I love it. Oh, it's a little bit more difficult. During the world of pressure, as I said, with the Mayan image. How good do you do it? I do it. I, I do it much slower. Yeah. Of, um, yeah. I can walk without a pain, but it's just yeah. the balance. It's, that's how it is. It's, it's, it's what I hate. I'm really just pretty much down in that shape. I like. I, when I got diagnosed two and a half years ago, I gained my 50 pounds. Because I was like, well, the touch of it. I didn't even know. I would think I didn't, but I, yeah. within, within a year, because I know it's, it's all, when there's, there's a, when there's willpower, there's a willpower. How are you guys doing? <clears throat> Getting there? If you wanted to grab a quick break, um, I think they just jumped out, but we'll probably get back into it here in a few minutes and then move on to the phase three. <clears throat>
Hi, Bayode. Can you hear me? Professor, can I? So basically, what we're doing, uh, we're just coming back from break now, but uh, you're going to get a partner, Bayode. It's an individual assignment, but the uh, instructions are on slide 16 of the slides from this week. And then we're going through, you're going to download the user centered design handbook, which is also found in the week two folder. And with your partner, you're going to interview them and fill out that PDF with all the instructions. You can watch through the recording and uh, I answer a bunch of questions that people have. Um, but basically, you go through there. You follow the PowerPoints uh, that we'll go through. So I'm going to share my screen <clears throat> and you'll see. You'll get an idea of what we're doing. OK. Well, I need to go to Postman. There we go. So you can see my screen. Yep. 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 <clears throat> there we go. And then there's these slides that say your turn. So I go through these different phases. So we're going to talk about wireframing now. So we've had a chance to interview. We've had a chance to now analyze the data that we collected and start to get an idea of like what do our users actually want, right? Because the whole idea of this is we're trying to put the user first. This is all centered around the user and what they want for the dashboard. So you're making this dashboard for your partner. Uh, okay. I say partner, but it's actually an individual assignment. <clears throat> and now we're going to create a wireframe and keep them involved in this process of wireframing. Has anyone made wireframes before? No. Oh, let me close that. I better close the breakout rooms because everyone's still in there. <laughs> and then people can join, join back. Let's give those a minute to close. Sorry, Professor. Sorry, Professor. Uh, mm -hmm. There you go. Welcome back to the main room. Yeah. Is the wireframe like a blueprint to a website when you're doing website development? The front end? Yeah, you got it. Yeah, so it's like a blueprint or kind of like a mock up. You can think of it like that. Yeah, have you made them before? Yeah, like I used to make websites for NGOs and like just for free, like just to do some community service kind of thing. Yeah. And moreover, I also got an internship in website development. So I did like make them like I used to tell my like I used to sit with them and then I used to tell them what picture do you have for your like website? Like what picture do you want? OK, so you yep. want like uh, they used to give me a picture like this is what we want. If you click here, you go like this and yeah. uh, you go into Something this place. And then I used to turn it into a live website. So it's that's kind of an ideology I used to. Yeah, yeah. So and then you use it to plan what the final product of the, of the website is going to look like. So this image here on the left is kind of like a, an example of what a wireframe could look like for, say, like a, a phone app. And then on the right, this might be like the website version. Um, so basically some of the important things to remember with the wireframe is you're not drawing what the final version of the website is going to look like. It's just a blueprint. So it's like a black and white. So you don't worry about the colors. You don't worry about the design. You don't worry about what image is going to be there. Usually you just put placeholder stuff. So it's just like to get an idea of like the structure of the website and the navigation more so than the actual design colors and, and fonts. So hierarchy of information, right? So are we starting with zoomed out version or you know big to small to smallest? <clears throat> Relationships between information. So you know if something is apparent to a child and if you click this, what happens? Does it bring us to a new screen? Does it drill down? Um, displays of information. So what kind of are we going to show charts here, visuals? Uh, are we going to show a graphic or a table? And then the interactivity. So if I click this, what happens if I scroll down, if I go over to another page? So it's it's not necessarily the look of it. It's more so the structure and those relationships behind the scenes. Hello, Professor. So, hello. Hello. 
Hello. Yeah, I have I a little have question. Question. Sure. For the for the page two, I don't really understand. But top four, five. A question about number four. Yes, and number five. Yes. I really don't understand what. How to attend to that? Can you throw more light so into that? When, when would you? Oh no, sorry. Page two, you said. Yes. Yeah, page, page two. two. So when would you use this information? So you're asking the user when they would use this information. And it's more so like, would they use this on a daily basis? Would they use this in the mornings? Would they use this throughout the day? Would it be something that they check constantly? Is it something that's a weekly notification that they get sent to their email? Um, right? Would they use it maybe once a month? Would they use it at the gym? That's moving into question five, which is where would you use this information? Would you use it at home? Would you use it out when you're at the gym? Would you use it uh, you know, at every meal when you're eating? Um, it depends on what you're tracking. Would you use it when you're out for a walk in the park and you're tracking your steps or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Then for yeah. the, 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 now, the, I'm finding it difficult I'm to, difficult to, to relate that page, page, two page two to page three. Page three. Where you said, said where, where, should where should our should product our fit product in their work or life? life? So what, what, so what, what, what are we talking about here? Where should our product fit in their work or life? Yes. Yeah, so it's kind of a similar question. It's getting another, it's getting more of an idea of how are we going to integrate this as part of their daily life? Is it going to fit into their daily life, their weekly life? How are we going to make this a part of it? And it says there you can make it a part of their work or you can make it a part of their life, make it part of their hobbies. Like. Something like Google Maps or Netflix, like you can think about how that's a part of your life, right? Where you maybe go home after work or something and then you turn on Netflix. Um, or something like Google Maps where it's part of people's lives where they use it whenever they're in their car. Right, so how is this product, how is this dashboard going to be part of your user's life? Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just trying, I'm just trying to understand the concept around this. So it's not, it's not necessarily what you think it should be part of their life, but you're asking the user, how would they want to use a dashboard? So think about if you're answering this question as a user, and you have a dashboard to tell you all about these things that you want to be more healthy in your life about. How would you want that to be part of your life? Would you want that to be something that you, you know, are constantly using on a day to day basis? Would you want it to be something that uh, you look at at the end of every day and you get a little summary or a report? Would you like to see monthly statistics or yearly averages? Like what kinds of things would you like it to be? Uh, in your life, how would you like it to fit or what role would you like it to play in your life? Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, because well, well, like yeah. for me, like, for I believe that, that for me to be able to, to design a dashboard, there the should dashboard. be some element of, some element of data. data. You know, like element data, of what? Data, 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 data. For me to be able to then the dashboard. So, but from this yeah. question now, from this question now that we are answering, how do I pick out? How do we get the data to plot into the axis for us to run then the dashboard? That's I'm right. Yeah, no, that's a good question, and we're gonna get to collecting that data uh, in the future. Right now, it's about the planning and it's about the expectations of how we would use it once we have that. So you don't have to worry about the data just yet. Okay. 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 Cool. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> so, uh, coming back here. So Alberto Cairo has this uh, this book. It's a good good read if you are interested in this type of stuff. Called the Functional Art and the Truthful Art, uh, talking all about wireframes and why we wireframe, and some of the quotes from it. So he says, "You need to build a solid backbone." for your information, a reading path, an order, a hierarchy, before you lock yourself into a style for your display. The structure is the skeleton and muscles of your graphic, and the visual style is the skin. 
With no bones to support it, the skin of your project will collapse. So wireframing really is that beginning, that structure, the bones that we then will make look pretty afterwards. So don't worry about all the colors and all that design until we've already wireframed. <clears throat> so here's an example of a poorly designed dashboard. What do you think are some things about this that are poorly designed? Yeah. So we don't really have any titles. We have got category, cause, and month, but we don't really know what we're reading. There is a near this media major, but what is it about? Yeah, we don't know. We're not really sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is gone. A few of the other things. So yeah, it's a count, but we don't know what the count is for. We've got customer spill, injury, transport, equipment security, but I, I'm still not sure what that means. There is no legend. There's no legend. Um, now, some of these charts, I would say too, are pretty similar looking. So it's not really giving us like a clear picture. Right, so we've got count here, we've got count here, we've got count here. We're going by month over there. Customer and stuff on the bottom, but then I've got design training and management. So I'm not sure exactly how to compare those two charts. Right. Yeah. And it, and this isn't even really a great year, great way line to do years, years right? To have line charts and then line charts and then line charts like that. Also the line is really yeah, line it's, it's making like <laughs> So the visualization of that chart, if you're making the line thickness, it's, yeah. it's uh, like overlapping and it's, yeah. really, it's not clean. Yeah, and uh, even like the alignment of the, the charts and stuff, like the bottom of this one, the axes aren't even lined up. Um, or even this, like this is obviously where you interact with the category of the month and the site on the right hand side, but it's a very confusing way to be able to filter your visuals, because I have no idea which filters is that applying to everything? Is that applying to just one of these? Yeah, very good. <clears throat> Here's an example of a well-designed dashboard. So in contrast, what we just looked at, what are some things about this one that we like? This yeah. I like this it's like doing that. It's yeah. Like can see the wrong index. Yeah, totally. It's properly, it has a proper legend which shows what color this is what. Yes, yeah, this is very important, this this key or this legend here, so we know what the colors represent on this map. Okay, the titles on the axis, GDP per person, uh, Big Mac price, so we know obviously we're comparing Big Mac prices. Uh, they also mentioned it, like Big Mac prices versus GDP per person. Yeah, yeah, and it says here, title Big Mac prices, uh, Big Mac index, that's the title of this chart, and we can see a, a list of countries going through here, and then the prices, uh, or is the percentages, yeah, to this, and we can see that the color corresponds to the, uh, the map as well. There's also nice white space as well, right? It's not just a ton of, yeah. it's like going back to this, right? This is, this just looks disgusting now. It's just there's no white space in here. This is clearly organized and we can get an idea of what's going on right away. <clears throat> cool, so understanding how to wireframe, you have to understand a couple of these concepts. So the first one is hierarchy, understanding or following how we read. So the more, most important information should go top left in that top left corner and then work with how we take any in the information, not against it. Right, so we always read left to right from the top to bottom, pretty typically, right? That's that's how most people would, would start. So starting in the top left, going across, moving down and over. Here's another good book uh, by Ben Schneiderman. So for visual information, uh, he has this mantra or this saying, so you do your overview first, then you zoom and filter, and then you can get those details on demand uh, once you want them. So you can zoom in if you need to, but overviewing first, because that's the easiest way to get a user engaged, is to just start with a very broad perspective and then allow them to zoom in 
where they want to. So here we can see top left, most important spot in the hierarchy, we've got our overview first, right? Down here we can get details on demand, and then we can zoom and filter. You know, we can now as a user we can pick which country we want to look at, and then we can go over and get those numbers. Right? This is the broad overview. There's not like exact detailed information in that, but then later on we can zoom and filter in to get the exact percentage of that country. It does zoom and filter Canada. Like, it has selected Canada over there. Yeah, yeah. So then now when you click uh, one of these, uh, Canada, then we can see that it's it's zoomed in, but now it's also filtered this chart here. Right? So we can get details on demand by interacting with the chart and clicking. Yeah, very good observation. <clears throat> Here's another one. How peaceful is our world? So you can see here, we've got a broad overview. We can select a band here to filter by the level of peace, right? So we can click here for the, to filter the most peaceful countries. And then on the right, we've got our details. So moving down country by country, we've got each index or the number from least peaceful or from most peaceful to least peaceful. And then you can hover over the map. So hovering over Syria, you can see it's a rank out of the countries. So wireframe components typically have some pretty common uh, elements to them. So texts, uh, titles, labels that you'll include for your charts um, or just for the entire um, dashboard. You might have a, a title or a logo. Uh, interactive elements such as filters, buttons. Uh, so we can see here we've got a filter for the month. Here we've got a hover or a tooltip, right? So that's a pretty common thing in dashboards that you can wireframe for. Here we've got uh, labels on this KPI, right? Real time users. The next thing, the next component, so we talked about hierarchy. The next component to understand is graph types. So form follows function. So you want to use specific graph types for the specific type of information you're showing. So if you're showing something over time, you'd want to use something like a line graph and not a, not necessarily a bar chart. You want to ensure that the data you're showing makes sense with the medium that you're showing it over. So something like this, making comparisons. If you want to see how you're doing against your neighbors, or if you want to see how close you were to achieving your target, <clears throat> you'd want to use something that you can compare, like a horizontal or vertical bar chart, or even a heat map where it really allows you to show the comparison and contrast to the cells around it. So here, we can see the comparisons pretty easily. On the right-hand side, it could be a color but also with the number, right? And choosing to show it that way versus just in a table, right? Um, allows us to visualize it really easily. <clears throat> Here's an example of, uh, we made one of these in Power BI last week, uh, the gauge metric. So if you were trying to track uh, your spending or something like that, you would use a gauge or a progress bar, like this uh, second picture here, to easily visualize something like that. Um, and here for comparisons, we're showing uh, polio cases in the United States, and then when the vaccine was introduced in 1955, and then you can see very quickly as a user, we can see from this zoomed out view, even though this is for each uh, state, <clears throat> Right, we get this color, which shows obviously the lighter the color, the, le the less cases, the higher, the darker red, the more cases. And then this line where it says vaccine introduced with that label, we can instantly see it just gets a lighter color from that zoomed out broad perspective. If we want to spot trends over time, we would use something like a line graph or an area chart or an area graph. So if you want to see how you're doing uh, over like the last month in sales or something like that, then you would use those types of visuals. Here's a cool one, seeing how popular Donald Trump is. And you can see on the bottom, we've got the different months, right? So we can see the change over time. 
You can see how our publications are doing in terms of views. <clears throat> and if you want to see distributions, so if you want to see what your lowest and highest scores are, so if you're tracking things like grades or um, if you want to see what score you're most frequently achie achieving, a histogram or a box and whisker chart would be, uh, oops, would be the best choices for that. To understand relationships, scatter plots and bubble plots are good for that. So if you want to know if you sleep less when you spend more time on your computer every day, one axis could be you know time spent on computer, and one axis could be hours of sleep. And you know if this was zero hours on your computer and you're seeing you're getting eight hours of sleep, but then as you get more hours on your computer, you get less hours of sleep. So maybe you're only getting four hours of sleep, and you see this trend. And the scatter plot's really good for that, right? You wouldn't use, uh, you wouldn't be able to use a line graph to de to de depict that kind of information. <clears throat> so we watched this video already, um, which is kind of cool. Proportions, so progress bar or a tree map. So if you want to compare sizes of something, if you want to see the number of times something happens, we use these types of charts. So again, we looked at this billion dollar gram, which shows, you know, the size of money spent on specific things and purple indicates fighting. So right away you can see there's a lot of green and there's a lot of purple. So green is you know earnings from like Walmart and illegal drug profits and those types of things. <clears throat> the next concept, so we've talked about hierarchy, we've talked about the types of charts we're using uh, is interactivity. So how might a user interact with the data for exploration and self-discovery. So uh, being able to make decisions, uh, trusting their, their data, getting them engaged. Um, and you, you also allow collaboration. So if they were using your dashboard in a meeting or something, a team of people could be together in a boardroom and collaborate uh, by being able to interact with it. So here, some of the interactivity filters we have on this chart uh, in the top left. Just by clicking one of these bands, it would filter out and you can see which countries fall into these bands. Or you can explore by year and you can then visualize that world map uh, by year. So when you click that peace band, then we can see the, the most peaceful countries. And then it just kind of unhighlights the rest of them. <clears throat> we can also sort on the right hand side, so that's also an interactive thing. So you could sort it and then you could organize it by the least peaceful. Tooltips is another great one. So by being able to hover over an element, you can get more information. So if you hover over Syria, then you get this tooltip that shows you from 2008 to 2018 what their overall score is and where they rank out of those countries. So your turn now. You're going to go to page five of the handbook. And with the focus of the analysis being about a healthier lifestyle, we're going to use the information we got from the last few pages from our, uh, our user who we're interviewing. And we're now going to sketch and draw out a wireframe for this dashboard that we think our partner could use, our partner needs um, in that handbook. Okay, so again, remember just black and white. Try to get an idea of what types of charts we would use to track those statistics or analytics that they're interested in or that they need to achieve their healthy lifestyle. All right, so I'll open up the break rooms uh, in Teams. Any questions? Sorry, I. Yeah. I I'm trying to locate these documents or uh, the PDF you want us to use. I can't I can find it, please. So uh, it's right here, Israel. You come to the weekly learning. Module one, week two. And then it's the fifth and the fourth links here. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Welcome. What do we do in page four? So page four is just giving you uh, like a breakdown of what I just covered in the slides so that you don't have to go through the slides again. So you can just get an idea of like to make comparisons. We use vertical bullet or heat maps to see distributions, box, box and whisker or histogram. 
and then to spot trends over time, line and area chart, and then uh, relationships, scatter plot bubble. And then down here, we're going to start to draw or sketch out our wireframe. Cool. All right, I'm going to open up the breakout rooms for you guys. Yeah, just feel like you have a understanding of what you might do for your dashboards? Yeah. Yeah, cool. You guys are still just going to start some of the interview questions? Yeah. Yes. 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 Do you guys have another class on Mondays or? Another one tonight. Oh, okay. It's offline, but the professor is going to be out for two weeks, so we say oh. that he's going to take it online. Online, only for the first two weeks, I see. There's some cool tools here. They're also linked in the PowerPoint. So this is called Viz Palette, and it's uh, it's really good for being able to just if you want to get colors for um, your visuals, you can just copy the hex codes like this, and you can choose from different themes and and see what they might look like, which is kind of cool. And then there's this one for visualizing data on a map. So there's two tests that you can run. Um, if you can distinguish every color in each random section of the map, and then within each large band of color, can you distinguish the different classes? So here we have three classes of color, and you should be able to visually see the difference. And as we add classes, so here's seven, you should be able to individually depict each seven, right? So these are our seven colors. So you should be able to see, it might be hard over the projector, one, two, three, four, five. You can go from the top on the section, so like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, and you should be able to. So it's just something to keep in mind when you are picking colors. There's these tools to help you with that kind of thing. Anyways, don't let me interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> 
that's one thing we go on. Feels a little chilly in here, eh? Like they turned the air conditioning on. Oh my goodness. I don't know if I can even change it. I just started feeling cold air come from these. Wow, it has all the things. These are the things. So, what is the ICG again? So this class is over at one, right? Okay. So I'm just going to interrupt you guys again. I know you guys are. Um, I know you guys are wireframing. But we only really have five minutes left of class here. So I'm closing the breakout rooms just to give you guys instructions for the rest of the PowerPoint. <clears throat> Hello, Professor. I was returned to the class. Sorry, so we're just coming back to the main section here just because we have about five minutes left of class before I think okay. sometimes people start okay. uh, gathering in the hall for their next class. So I just wanted to give you a brief overview of how to use the rest of the PowerPoint to finish the assignment. So you're going to do these wireframes and then you're going to swap roles and then make the wireframe and involve the user who you're interviewing um, through that process. And then the next thing we're going to do is um, you know, start ranking our information. What's the most important, remember? And being able to put the most important in the top left. <clears throat> so you might be tracking all these different statistics. You're going to you're going to rank them or sort your cards out or however you want to do it uh, by level of importance, how you're going to filter it, how you're going to sort it and your tooltip detail. So you can see here, this is a tool for ranking, you know, the very important stuff, some important, not important at all. Um, the next thing you're going to do is get some user feedback. So I think this is page, uh, what, what's the next page, six? So you're going to recap your user's needs and walk through the proposed design. So now that you've got a wireframe, you're going to ask them, it's page six. Yeah, page six. You're going to show the user what you've made, and then you're going to give them opportunities for questions and comments on what you've designed. And then you're going to probe them for things that they might find confusing or things that they like, dislike, missing elements from that wireframe. So you're going to go through that. And there's this uh, matrix. So there's these likes, dislikes, questions, and suggestions box that you're going to just take note of what the user thinks about those things in your dashboard. And then once you do that, so that's page six. You're going to take note of all those things. Then you're going to start to prototype. And you're going to go through this and you're going to start to put that skin on those bones. So you've made the, the wireframe. Now you're going to start deciding color, branding, your mock data, graph elements, and then answer some of these questions. Um, again, if you want to see uh, or read about this, if you're interested about color, Cole Nussbaumer, uh has a cool uh, seven lessons about color in that book. Um, so just go through these PowerPoints. Again, you can see color should be used sparingly. So this is our bad example of our graph. Here we've got a good example where we're just using black, white, and then red is really emphasizing that color. Um, and it can also carry quantitative value as well. All right. So just go through the rest of the PowerPoint, and then you'll come to these. This is actually a cool one. So this visual shows uh, gendered ethnic disparities at tech companies. So you've got a company like Airbnb or uh, Dropbox, and it's a flower, right? So the top left is, is uh, the ethnicity, so white, Asian, Latin, Latino, and black. And then the size of it depicts the number of employees of that ethnicity, and then male and female is pink. So you can see companies that go more to the top left and the top right 
their boys, if it's more blue, then there's more male. If it's more pink, then there's more female. And you can see the, uh, the gender and ethnic disparities between those companies. So color and hue can kind of depict that information. Uh, so these are the tools I just was talking about, Viz Palette and Color Brewer. So you're going to take a turn once you go through those slides and uh, start to prototype the color and what you're going to choose, how you're going to denote the, the analysis of the information and specify those charts and graphs uh, that your user is going to be using. And then <clears throat> oh, maybe I'll cover this next week, but Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll go through this next week, but this is the final this is the final section. So this is where you're actually going to get them to use the prototype and go through it and see how well they can actually accomplish the tasks that you've laid out. You'll go through this script with them and then uh, you'll they'll ask these questions and probing questions like, oh, why did you click that? Why did you go there? What did you expect to happen? How did you decide to do that? And then you're going to you know, clarify some of these issues or classify some issues as major issues, minor issues, and then uh, follow the, following these instructions with that sketch prototype, you're going to conduct a detailed usability test. So they're going to then test your prototype. You're going to be clear, clear on what questions you want to ask and record their answers on page eight of the handbook. And then uh, that's going to uncover those issues with your prototype design. You're going to work with, the, with your partner to classify them on page nine. And then lastly, based on those issues, you're going to try to uh, list any design change recommendations to the prototype that would resolve those issues. OK, and you're not going to create another prototype. You're just going to list what you would change to fix those issues. And then you submit the handbook and the prototype file in Blackboard. OK, so then we would be done the first three steps of the user centered approach to data viz. Right, so we researched. We wireframed, then you're going to prototype and, and keep the user involved that whole time. And then we'll move to the next three uh, the following weeks. OK, and I believe that that's it for this PowerPoint. So this PowerPoint is your best friend, kind of takes you step by step through the process. Um, and yeah, that's that's the gist of it. Any questions? Cool, due June 5th. So you got a bit of time, but don't leave it to the last minute. And uh, we're going to build on this through the semester. So you've got a prototype and then we're going to build it in Power BI and then we're going to build it in Tableau. So we're going to keep building on this throughout the whole year. So the planning phase is more important than you think. So just keep that in mind as you're doing this, that you will actually be making it as well. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the prototype file will be uh, will be like a PDF that you actually you actually design with the color and everything. So you're gonna you're gonna draw it out and then you're gonna actually create like a digital version of that drawing. So you could use Figma, you could use Adobe XD. Sorry guys, I also forgot to grab attendance, so I'm just going to do that quick. I've got the shock. Yep. Arda, yes, Lakshit, I'm forgetting your names again. Raj, where is it? 20, oh, there we go. Perfect. And here, oh, we're here? Perfect. Thank you. Hello. 
Is the attendance important? Thanks, have a good week. Sorry, say that again. Is the attendance important? Is it? What is it? Oh, I like to keep track of it, yeah. But uh, it's just it's just for my own records. Just oh, so okay. I can understand who's coming to class and how I can help. I, I mark if they're in person or teams. Oh, okay. What was that? I thought I heard something, but cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for sure. I know, eh? It does that. Lots of information and lots of great information. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, of course. No worries. Well, I have to, I have to, uh, the other, you know, the other well, group, not group members, but other people's contact. Finally.